when this decade started there was an ample belief that it's a golden decade for india as many meaningful reforms were executed in the last decade but then before the decade could begin the world was hit with covid-19 it took two years away from this decade and now when everything is back to normal us is hit with recessionary fears on one side and inflationary fears on the other this in turn does impact indian economy and markets as well in such a scenario is it possible for active fund managers to generate benchmark beating returns sustainably over this decade and how do investors select the best fund suited for them when every fund and fund manager has his or her own story to tell having put that thought out our next set of panelists will discuss on managing other people's money as business along with the promise of outperformance let's meet our panelists mr madana gopal ramu who is the head of equities and fund manager at sundaram alternates he has over 15 years of experience in the indian financial markets he joined sundaram mutual fund in 2010 as a research analyst from centrum broking and has made rapid progress during his tenure in sundaram amc he became the head of equity research in april 2015 and started actively managing fund from january 2016 he comes with strong academic qualifications as a qualified cost accountant and a management degree from bim trichy our next panelist is mr av srikanth he is a co-founder and ceo of neo wealth he has 24 years of experience leading private wealth management business as ceo of motilal oswal and anand rathi he has over two decades of advisory experience that spans across three market cycles since late 90s he subsequently founded bridgemonte advisors india's first digital multi family office platform that developed advisory alpha process srikanth is a PGDBA in finance and marketing from Ifkai Business School. Our next panelist is Mr. Harsh Agarwal. He's the head of alternative strategies at Tata Asset Management. Harsh has more than eighteen years of experience in equity portfolio management as well as research. Prior to joining Tata Asset Management, Harsh worked largely in hedge fund setups and proprietary trading firms. Har started his career by managing family investments and shortly moved on to providing equity research and advisory to Equitec a long shot equity proprietary trading desk of Deutsche Bank and Rock Capital Management LLP during his tenure with Vista Soft India next up we have Mr Ananya Kumar the president and national sales head at IIFL asset management he is responsible for driving the domestic sales at IIFL AMC he has more than two decades of experience in corporate banking retail banking wealth management and asset management at senior leadership positions and has handled both b2b as well as b2c segments of the business The session will be moderated by Ms. Lakshmi Iyer. Lakshmi Iyer is the CEO of Investment Advisory Business at Kotak Investment Advisors Limited. She has been with the Kotak Group for over twenty-two years. Prior to joining Kotak, Lakshmi worked with Credence Analytics Private Limited as a research analyst, where she was tracking corporate bond markets in India and generating research reports. She holds an MBA degree in finance from Narsi Monji Institute of Management Studies. She has been recognized as one of the top 25 most influential women in asset management in Asia by Asian Investor. Over to you, Ms. Ayer. Thanks, Abhijit. Hi, very good afternoon to each one of you, uh, to my uh, fellow panelists and the audience here. Uh, last session, but. Uh, Though it's food for thought, I'm assuming it comes after food for tummy, which is very very difficult because I always believe when the Madhya Pradesh, which is the center of the tummy, is full, the Uttar Pradesh stops working. So hopefully, I think the panelists out here are going to have a very very herculean task because I have been given the easier job of talking and obviously uh, asking questions. 
whereas the uh, thinking hats have been have to be worn by each of you. Uh, and you know, as we were starting off uh, getting introduced into this panel, uh, some thoughts were coming up and uh, the year 2022 obviously is just a year gone by. Clearly, as per the Chinese calendar was the year of the tiger. And uh, I don't know if asset classes ended up roaring, but clearly it was the central bankers who were roaring uh, with rate hikes, whether it's in India, whether it's in the US or the rest of the world. And we saw near convergence in asset classes, specifically equities and fixed income where um, if you blank off the category and the scheme name and you tell them decide is this a liquid fund or a large cap fund, you were actually scratching your head to figure out which one is what. So I think there were near convergences. Uh, of course, uh, gold uh, did a La Lal Singh Chadda act. Uh, it said Main Dorta Gaya, Dorta Gaya. So that was one asset class which actually gave uh, a great positive return. But more thanks to the uh, rupee depreciation rather than the price point of gold increase. So, you know, this is the kind of, um, I would say, market that we are in as we come into uh, 2023. From the tiger, we move into the year of the rabbit. The key question is, is the roar going to recede and peace going to restore? I ask the question on key investors' minds. But um, the other thing which obviously investors are seeking is... Uh, you know, show me the alpha, which is, you know, where I, I'm very happy. This is where the numbers are. This is where the benchmark is. Show me the uh, return over and above that. So I think that is, is or was the trigger point for this panel. And I'm glad that we have some very great speakers out here. So without, uh, you know, much, let me just hit straight uh, to the nail. Uh, uh, Shrikant, I want to start off with you. Uh, the largest, um, you know, uh, flexi cap fund is close to about 40,000 crores. The largest uh, ETF, of course, uh, that's the market, but that's about a lakh and 50,000 crores. The largest mid cap fund is close to about 35,000 crores. So these are, you know, some of the uh, leaders in their respective category. Now, um, Question to you is that as the AUM grows, uh, specifically in these kind of categories where you're expected to have flexibility or you're expected to have mid caps or small caps in your portfolio, A, does the performance actually take a beating? So firstly, I want you to elaborate whether it's a fact or a fiction. And if that is true, assuming that is true, why is it that the polarization still continues that, you know, bulk of the AUM, for example, even if you see in a flexi cap category, three funds are you know over a lakh crore of AUM and Bitto and mid cap it's three or four funds which are contributing to almost 75 to 80 percent of the AUM so any thoughts uh, on that uh, Shrikant? Thanks Lakshmi you made it more difficult uh, by asking a very important question right at the beginning but let me try so uh, size has certain advantages in terms of diversification being able to allocate reasonable money behind every idea but I also believe that size also limits flexibility uh, Indian markets have not been that liquid beyond the first 150 to 200 names. And when the proportion of money that has to be invested in each company becomes substantially large, and uh, you actually create your own performance. And when you want to book profits and exit, you also have limitations. So size very, uh, in a mathematical way itself, is very uh, easy to understand that it does limit the FlexiCap's ability to maneuver. So the, currently the sizes that have uh, accrued in each of the successful schemes makes it, uh, make, makes it possible that you'll have to live with the total cycle to deliver the performance, but not based on the proactive changes you could make to sectors and stocks so uh, much, as much as a relatively smaller fund with the same mandate can do. Now, when it comes to the large size of how did this uh, top five funds or fund houses um, really gather those AUMs at a fund house level and also the scheme level, it's very easy to correlate that they're also led by large distribution powerhouses. Many of them are led by banks where the point of sales are immense. Many of them have touch points which have been built over a 20 year period. So that probably determines far more as to why money has flowed into them rather than necessarily performance uh, itself. No, so uh, the the way they say uh, uh, andha hai, uh, is it also fair to say investor andha hai? I mean, they would be also seeing, right? There could be some uh, gradations on performance or that's true even for the not so large size funds, Shrikant. Uh, I'm sorry, can you rephrase your question? 
No, I'm saying that when size, well, as you said, size acts as a deterrent. I'm saying uh, don't investors question uh, they are, uh, you know, they are respective touch points. If there is, uh, you know, a size is actually tending to pull down performance, the course correction, et cetera, because you said the gravitation is largely because of the large distribution powerhouses who end up. So that's the question I had. Wealth managers who've been able to uh, take customers into confidence do tend to recognize the difficulty that large uh, schemes have and are able to move them to uh, reasonably manageable asset sizes that they believe will be able to take quick decisions in response to changing market conditions. So those people are able to engage, but many people don't have that view uh, in being able to see through these uh, data points and take a earlier conviction in a lesser known name, which has the likelihood of better performance either because of the style match, consistency or etc. So people who could go through that education with the customers do take decisions, which is why even the smaller AMCs do have sizable AUMs. Otherwise, it would have been definitely yeah. lesser. No fair point. I think that is a, a trend that you, you are seeing that while polarization is true, the degree of polarization is receding and maybe 2021, 22 was a classic case in point where we saw some of these large funds actually see net outflows at a time when some of the mid category size funds were actually gaining traction oh. uh, on that note madan i have uh, you know another uh, quick uh, related point but this is more from you know uh, the uh, public market and of course i've also managed uh, money and i've had the same grouse with our team there uh, what usually at least is the tendency that there is money uh, you know flocking looking at rare view driving so you see a nice impeccable track record money starts flowing in and the moment thoda pasa palat jata hai some bit of uh, you know headwinds uh, you start seeing uh, an outflow uh, now, A, it could be because of the recency bias. It's also probably because uh, there are hardly any predictive models in India or globally for that matter. And uh, the tendency to shortlist funds by uh, the gatekeepers or asset allocators are largely based on the one, two, three year kind of performance. And, uh, and of course, the tendency to exit also happens when there is an underperformance. Now, you know, since you manage public money, do you really think and how much, if you really think, how much does it really impact the performance? And do you really have dialogues, you know, with your own um, sales team or your own core leadership team that, uh, you know, this is uh, not the right way to do, if at all you believe or if you believe contrary? Thanks, thanks, Lakshmi, and uh, 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 good afternoon to all the uh, 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 investors who have come for this forum. Uh, see, uh, one year, one year performance, performance, even two year performance, performance to that extent, extent being, being the basis, basis to uh, make, uh, make changes, changes in allocations or, or making changes to the portfolios is a very dangerous game, in my opinion. Um, I am saying this, I'll give you two examples here. Uh, first point is, I think, uh, in the long term, what is in the hands of a fund manager, particularly a long only fund manager like us, is only earnings. What is not there in your hands and what can actually drive markets in short term are uh, inflation, interest rate cycles, like what is happening in 2022, and even sometimes flows, right? And importantly, how central bankers react to this inflation and interest rate cycles. Uh, these are some things which are not in the hands of the uh, fund managers at all. Um, and then uh, you are then judging a fund manager based on his investment philosophy and trying to see how he has reacted to a particular phase of a market cycle. Um, so really to judge based on short term factors like uh, inflation, interest rate cycles being very, very sharp movements in the last one year or even in the past this has happened are going to be really difficult. I'm not saying it's uh, a fund manager should not be judged from a one year to a performance, but I'm saying it's getting really difficult uh, for people to do it. And uh, any change in during that period, and I'll give you an example. Uh, last year was a period of very high inflation. And nobody would have expected it at the beginning of 22, right? Uh, so the ideal thing is a fund manager should shift this completely this investment style because uh, the stocks that have done well in the last one year are stocks which have not done for the last uh, five years or even 10 years. Uh, PSUs have not done well and there were uh, statements made in 2020 or 19 that if you have avoided PSU, you have made good money. But if you had followed it in 2022, you would have lost money or not made the enough returns. Now, this is due to high inflation. People chose to skew more towards low PE stocks irrespective of quality. When the inflation, inflation comes, comes off, off 
and predictably most of the economists are predicting that inflation is likely to fall off very sharply from second quarter of calendar year 2023 so the performance can change dramatically different now if you take one year performance and uh, uh, make a change the investor has got hit on both the side and that can dramatically change an investor's return from a five year perspective i think the ideal situation should be that align the invest investment philosophy and the investor and let them go through at least a 3 to 4 year time period and uh, i think in our case whenever uh, there has been a misselling we have tried to address it uh, and we have always said when an investor should come in when i have addressed myself certain large investors that be prepared to see a 5 to 10% erosion but stay with at least 4 to 5 years to reap the benefit of ideas that we are bringing on the table and investors who have stayed with us more than 4 to 5 years uh, they have gone but we have generally not seen redeeming at all and we have seen periods where we have underperformed but in the last 10 12 years of existence the number of years that has happened has been very less and every investor understands this and they have reaped the benefit of staying through the long period rather than reacting to that one year of performance here and there and i think it this is a this is, that, that's something which we try to convey to our sales team as well and the investors generally understand this much better in my opinion no i think, I think uh, uh, that's very important also given the fact that uh, wealth creation is actually a journey and uh, every time when you switch on a google map and you keep seeing every minute of red uh, does that really tempt you to actually take a u turn and go back the answer is probably no so if the answer for that is no and you are focused on reaching your journey i think madan i agree with you that the longevity the nature of longevity the more you try to uh, push that into the you know or populate that into the mind of an investor i think that will be uh, good we are already seeing i would say initial signs of it it's a good trend uh, but yeah it has to sustain and last uh, you know on a more durable basis uh, and 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 to that uh, you know anune i have a very very uh, topical question for you and and this keeps coming i'm sure uh, every time uh, and there is always um, a tug of war happening between uh, say a manufacturer uh, and an investor at different points in time we've seen and this is true for quite a few asset classes but if i talk about equities we've seen that usually when there is euphoria there is you know greed and fear to lalach mein log bolte aur laga aur laga to wo fomo ho jata hai you know there is that fear of missing out and you see money is uh, coming into that uh, so what happens is that you know industry also is there a tendency of trying to uh, introduce those strategies uh, jaise bolte hain uh, हवा का झोंका तो हवे के साथ बैती गंगा में हाथ धो लो और जैसे यू गेट स्ट्रेटेजीज यू जस्ट लॉन्च इज दैट हैपनिंग इज इट हैपनिंग वेरी कंसिस्टेंटली लाइक 2008 वी सॉ द लॉन्च ऑफ से इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर फंड्स Uh, at another time we saw there was a beeline made towards you know these multi dimensional multi category funds now uh, is this uh, a trend which has now kind of seen a seizure uh, or and how does the investor uh, global funds are another case in point again we saw a line you know long line of these funds being launched um, and uh, then of course there's a story to tell always and uh, contrary to the popular opinion in the long term we are dead uh, it is seemingly a case of in the short term we are not alive so any views on that anunay yeah thanks lakshmi and a good afternoon everyone uh, i will rather try and address this question in two parts one is uh, you know what drives this behavior and second part would be what are the probable solutions that one can uh, uh, propose uh, what drives the behavior let me first talk about it you know if i go back on a sensex or last 20 to 23 odd years what we have seen is sensex had demonstrated on a price to book something close to 3.1 and if i add a standard deviation positive and a standard deviation negative i'm talking about largely broadly if i would simply talk about we are talking about a price to book of a 2 and a 4 which is what the markets have largely largely respected you know now if you see whenever the market goes closer to the price to book of a 2 your past one year return is not more than 3 to 5% which is negative actually not even positive but the next three year return if you look at is close to 40 45% now that's an ideal time when you should be investing but you'll be surprised to hear lakshmi that the investment flows during that time is practically zero now if i go back the other extreme which is the price to book of a four where my past one year return is close to 45 
my next three year return is not more than five. The flows are 8% still. And the beauty is between two and a four, which is in the highest amount of flow come around the price to book between three and a four, where past one year return is 26. And 56% uh, money are actually getting flown during these levels. And that money is actually chasing a next year return not more than 10% per annum. So this is a classic behavior, which is rear view mirror. And you did mention about that line in, in one of the questions that you had spoken with the panelist. So this is the behavioral pattern that we have seen, which is to just chase the past performance. Now, how do we address this? I think to me, the way to look at it, we need to uh, you know focus on three parts. One is at the product level. Second is the responsibility with an advisor. And a third would be, I would call it a regulator who have to play a very critical role over here. Now, at a product construct, you know, when we do it as an, as an asset manager, it is our responsibility to ensure that it that all kinds of transparencies and you know disclosures should be made to the investors on all kinds of risks that are associated with the product, whether it's a liquidity risk or whether it's a concentration risk, whichever way one would want to look at it. Transparency is very, very critical so that investors are aware of where they are putting their monies in. Then comes the role of an advisor. Advisor roles are very, very critical because they are the intermediaries between advice, between a, and, and the manufacturer and the end user. It is their duty to ensure that a product that they are advising suits to the needs of an individual, keeping their financial goals and a risk tolerance in mind. You know, so that's very, very critical. And the third to me would be the role of an of the regulators. You know, they should be empowered with enough. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I would say powers, so that you know, they are they should be able to take the corrective measures of all the possible malpractices that one can think during these times and ensure that the last interest of the investors gets protected. So you know, so it is a role wherein all three uh, inter you know uh, uh, participants have to play their part of the role. You know, in terms of ensuring it. No, fair point. And I think uh, to that, uh, there is this Ganje ko kangi kyu bechoge wala funda hota You might be a very, very astute, uh, I would say, negotiator or a salesperson or whoever as the case may be. But uh, the utility, if it's not there, obviously we, we cannot, uh, you, you know, expect uh, that kind. And uh, I think you very rightly pointed out that um, there has to be a three-way process that uh, each stakeholder takes responsibility uh, for his or her actions. Uh, uh, ultimately, it's it's not really a one-man or a one-woman act. Uh, Harsh, uh, you know, the question to you, and I think this is a raging debate in the industry, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a portfolio manager's uh, pet peeve, as I call it. Uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, this classic debate about... Uh, Everyone wants to be or thinks he or she is a fund manager. And when, you know, when an active manager uh, belies faith, you know, over a very short term or maybe over a long term, uh, there is this tendency to believe that, uh, you know, I'm giving you money because I don't have the time. It's not that I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm giving you money because I don't have the time. And this active and passive debate uh, is now, as I said, extremely, extremely rampant and gaining momentum at different points in time. Uh, 2022 was, of course, one exaggerated case, but of course, there have been cases in the past. Now, um, uh, the question to you is that uh, what uh, what is the investor missing? Uh, is it actually the way to look at it? We have seen in pockets, there is significant alpha. In fact, uh, my own belief has been that uh, mid markets over longer period of times, especially in a country like India, has an alpha generating potential or is it that the size of the portfolio and the underlying nature of the stock makes the uh, inability of action and therefore leading to uh, you know add pockets a uh, passive outperforming active so that's that's the question and and the view from you harsh uh thanks Lakshmi, for that question i'm sorry that i have to switch off my camera my net is a bit weak uh so without camera it probably will work better I think it's a very, very interesting question. Uh, 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 but before I come to equities per se, uh, let me just give you a quick uh, background about what's happening on the fixed income side as well. Uh, so my belief, uh, you know, working with Tata Mutual Fund uh, is that uh, a lot of fixed income money is actually coming to passives now. If you look at uh, some of these uh, state government bonds, uh, constant maturity funds, target maturity funds, 
because of their low fee structure it is very very attractive for the investors and the active fixed income market is actually uh, not getting so much flows because whatever extra returns you're getting by taking either credit risk or active duration calls it is kind of getting offset because of the higher fee structure so i think uh, you know relative to the whole world where let's say in us we are seeing uh, very very massive flows on etfs where etfs itself has begun become bigger than the mutual fund industry i think india is moving on the other direction where fixed income is becoming more and more and more and more passive uh, in fact i believe that the active space of fixed income is moving to aifs uh, so if you look at let's say uh, credit risk funds or what you call as managed risk uh, that is going to category 2 because it has a lock ended structure so lock ended structure you know has has advantages of not having redemptions so you can manage the credit risk better in a aif cat 2 structure similarly where you need liquidity and you need higher returns that money is moving entirely to category 3 aifs long short funds uh, they are doing an extremely good job so imagine long short funds doing uh, you know about 10 12% versus income which is making about 6 odd percent so if you need liquidity then that active space is getting more and more towards you know category 3 aifs Now, but coming to equities, taking a step back and coming to equities, yes, I have read about you know uh, the underperformance of uh, primarily the large cap funds. I do believe that uh, the small cap funds in general have outperformed the indices. The mid caps are somewhere in between. Some funds have done well or uh, beaten the index. Some funds have not. Uh, the predominant case of you know uh, bench funds active underperforming is coming on the large cap side. um uh, now i have to tell you that i am a large cap specialist we run long short strategy uh you know in in, in our aifs which primarily deals with the top 200 companies so all the large caps and the large the mid caps and i can tell you you know very very upfront that india is an extremely attractive extremely attractive alpha market it is a complete you know a uh, uh, a complete paradise for somebody who is good on stock picking and i can tell you with my experience because i have also you know tracked and traded uh, us markets european markets and asian markets us is a very very difficult alpha market and india on the other hand is a very very beautiful uh, alpha market if you give your money to a large a good large cap specialist or a good fund manager he should come out you know at least 400 to 500 bips over benchmark now why why we are seeing if that is the case then why are we seeing that some of the fund managers or some of the fund has haven't done well over the last 1 to 2 years uh, i think uh, i think and this is not my you know granular assessment of any of the fund houses or the managers but what i have seen in general is that people are focused lot uh, a lot more on the bottom up stock picking or what is happening in india what is happening with the companies what the fact is that when you are dealing with the large caps and the mid caps uh, as against small caps uh their foreign exposure of of the businesses itself is about 25% so for 25% of your average sales of the large caps and the mid caps are coming from let's say export market so one what is happening globally is directly influencing your business secondly uh, what we have seen is that uh, whatever let's say themes or patterns emerge in global markets especially in us they get replicated or mimicked in other markets as well in india it gets mimicked with a with some sort of lag so to ignore what is happening globally in global context i think it is very very detrimental to your fund performance and if covid is anything to you know uh, uh, to learn from what we have seen very very clearly that consumer behavior across the globe has by has been by and large similar it's very very strange but whether the consumers were there in us or china or india their behavior with respect to how they behaved when covid was there and when the economy reopened was very very similar dramatically similar to so the stocks of the sectors that outperformed in certain phases that happened in india also so i think uh, i think as as fund managers as asset managers we have to gear up i think this market is very ripe for alpha making i think 4 500 basis points over index is a certain it's a must that fund managers should do not only to justify the fees but also you know to justify this beautiful alpha market that we have so i am totally not you know in favor of uh, indices or etfs on equities i am highly favorable on the bonds or debt market side but not on equities i think we all should put in effort to evaluate the fund managers and what their specialty is what their thought process is i am quite sure that there will be several managers who will beat indices even in the large cap space hands down thanks that's my bit 
No, without a doubt, Harsh, I think you hit the nail, uh, you know, right on the bull's eye. Uh, I think India as, uh, you know, uh, clearly being an oasis in the desert, despite sandstorms, has demonstrated that if you are able to back the right kind of manager and be with him or her during those sandstorm phases, there's clear outperformance, which is very, very visible. But, you know, since you said identifying the right manager, you know, that triggered the next question. And Anuna, this question is to you. Uh, there are tons and tons of strategies, product schemes available in the market. Uh, and, uh, you know, you will say you're the best. I'll say I'm the best. Uh, Madan will say he's the best. You know, everyone will say that I'm the best. And the yastic of the best is, is something, it's like beauty lies in the eye of the beholder. So, how do you, you know, at, at, a, at a scenario where I write six and you assume it's nine and we all think that we are, uh, you know, kosher and above board, how should really the investor evaluate this before taking uh, an informed decision and decide whether uh, he should or she should give money to you or me or to uh, anybody yeah. else? Great question, uh, Lakshmi. I think, uh, you know, some part of it also lies on individuality of an investor. Uh, foremost, his selection criteria should be based on his needs. You know, is the product meeting to his needs, his goals, his objective for investment? That's very, very critical. Once you have done it, you know, then obviously we can look at those mundane approaches like a feature, performance insights, expenses, taxation, so on, so forth that one does it. But the two uh, aspects become extremely critical in this. You know, one is uh, the return that this uh, funds are generating to you. Assume, I'm assuming that all the other uh, you know, features that's needed for a selection criteria are, are meeting to your requirements and the fund is suiting to you. Then you should certainly look at the return. And when you talk about a return, the most important part is a risk adjusted return. You know, and here the element of risk could be attributed to your liquidity risk. It could be the concentration risk. It could be anything else. So that is very, very critical. Not only the return, that should be an influential you know, proposition for a selection, but a risk adjusted is very, very important. And the second aspect to me, which is very critical over here is return adjusted to standard deviation. You know, because what you wouldn't want to see happening in your portfolio is a 10% up and a 10% down. You know, so volatility is something or a contained volatility is something that is very, very critical over here. So to me, if it is meeting to your criteria, you can you have if you have ensured that you know the returns are adjusted well to the risk and the volatility are contained. The last thing that you should do is please go and consult your financial advisor because he is the man who understands this subject the best. And you know, and certain aspects like uh, uh, you know, when we have a medical emergency, what do we do? We obviously go to the best of the doctor. You're managing well is nothing short of a financial emergency. So that is the case. Why even if you have understood it pretty well, please go and consult your financial advisor and take their advice and then only take the decision. I hope all of you are hearing what Alunai rightly said or just said because, you know, uh, standard deviation and uh, risk adjusted returns uh, is something, as I said, you know, as, as a money manager, uh, you know, we've been chasing it down the gullet or the throat of the investor stroke advisor stroke distributor. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only thing uh, bulk of them still end up looking at is returns and uh, risk is the most forgotten four letter word in good times. And in not so good times, uh, all the four letter, other four letter words actually end up manifesting. So it's very important to keep this in mind that but obviously it has its own health hazards. You know, we, we've been discussing about alpha, we've been discussing about um, risk adjusted returns, how to choose the right fund. But, you know, there is this... Uh, incremental breed of, uh, you know, uh, thought process, which is uh, gyrating towards, you know, this is a volatile market. Uh, so you have to be some side long, some side short. Um, and, uh, you know, you are, when you are fearful, there is a different behavior. And when you're greedy, these are the two, uh, you know, uh, psychology behavior, which investor typically depicts, whether as an investor or as a money manager. Uh, Mother, I want to, you know, uh, get you in here to check with 
with you there is this beautiful category called long shot now is this a sustainable category we've seen a lot of patchy performances the you know long shot funds that i've been tracking through and through uh, actually generate returns in patches because the factors that uh, really drive these strategies are very unique to very uh, you know individual portfolio manager so uh, a is this um, a strategy worth scaling up and if you uh, you know uh, once wear your hat as an investor instead of a money manager would you invest your money in such strategies uh, we um... I have not put my money in long or uh, short strategies. First of all, uh, uh, second is uh, we uh, we did a very short work on uh, whether we can launch such a strategy in Sundaram, but uh, uh, the the, uh, the the consensus that we came across was like it's such an uh, extremely volatile sort of a, a category. Does it fit to our uh, values and the fit to our uh, uh, what we want to offer to the investors? What we want to stand for? So. Uh, the conclusion was that, as I said in the first question itself, that what is in the hands of the uh, fund manager is uh, 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 is the uh, predictability of the earnings of businesses. Uh, can we play that to the full extent? And uh, can we play the business cycles rather than trying to play the market cycles? So then we decided uh, to go ahead. And I, I feel that um, uh, the alpha creation uh, in in uh, through a multi-cap portfolio, uh, I think it is still, as uh, uh, Ash was highlighting, uh, it's still a, uh, we can create a meaningful alpha and uh, Sundaram alternates as, uh, and, and many other uh, PMS has also have created alpha. If you take a five year, 10 year view, uh, probably diversified funds are try getting it difficult, but I think uh, concentrated funds with, uh, with an, uh, uh, cap curve move between uh, mid and small cap, depending upon opportunities. I think there is still a long uh, way to go before India becomes a passive uh, sort of a market, a uh, 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 completely passive sort of a market. I think even in US, I think still active fund managers are there. But obviously, the investor who is coming in has to know what he's getting it uh, and then prepare for it. Uh, so long shot, uh, we are not into it and uh, neither I am key, uh, we are keen about it. Uh, I, I think uh, multi-caps uh, with, uh, with the direct uh, investment into businesses, uh, that, that makes a lot more sense, a uh, uh, lot more fits to our style is what we would say. Uh, so stick to basics. Let's... Yes, sorry, sorry yeah. Lashmi, if I, if I may you know, add on to that because I'm the only guy who's actually managing long short. Uh, you know, yeah. just for the benefit of the audience, I just want to clarify some concepts here. So the riskiest long short fund in the country, riskiest is equivalent to Nifty Risk. Uh, what you should understand about long short funds is that either they will make an outcome which is fixed term oriented or they make an outcome which is equity hybrid oriented. It could be like equity savings, it could be BAF like. The riskiest one is nifty like this. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, most people uh, misunderstand long short by pairing it to, uh, let's say, uh, equity products. Uh, long shots are actually not equity offerings. What they are trying to do is make you a fixed income outcome. If you look at the global hedge fund, which is equity long short, it's it's a it's a very very large market, about one trillion dollar assets under management, and it replaces your bonds. It replaces your government bonds, your fixed income, your FDs, whatever it is, and they they promise to make you somewhere around eight nine percent, and they generally do that. Indian long short funds, uh, the low risk ones, which are positioned on the fixed income alternative side. You take uh, the track record for last two, three years, they have been making about 10, 12%, whereas fixed income has not done much. Uh, so, you know, while some investors might be disappointed because uh, relative to Nifty, it has done less. On a tax, post tax basis, it is much lesser. But on the post tax basis, it is far superior to fixed income offering. We have done, uh, the long short industry has been, uh, let's say, uh, they have not done a good job in spelling out the positioning of the products correctly. Uh, but Long shot is a beautiful product, uh, and I can tell you with uh, you know assurance. I also I can also tell you that you know while you mentioned something about uh, you know uh, focused funds, you know making uh, uh, creating that alpha long shot actually the opposite version of whatever you have seen on the investment side. Uh, you know you can have a very diversified portfolio and you can still make very very substantial alpha on very low risk. Just to give you a number here, uh, we run two strategies, uh, and this is not to you know publicize our product, but just to state the facts of what. What one can expect from long short, one strategy is one fourth the risk of Nifty, and the other strategy is one third the risk of Nifty. 
with the one third risk or with one third volatility, that strategy is making Nifty equivalent risk, equivalent returns, and with a standard deviation, you know, of just about five ish. And somebody mentioned about you know risk adjusted returns, returns by risk. Uh, the sharp ratio, or we call it risk adjusted returns, is somewhere between two to three. Uh, nobody in long long only industry has achieved that outcome of two to three sharp ratio over a you know on a meaningful period. But uh, we do in our funds. Uh, just to clarify, what long short you know can do uh, relative to equity hybrids or relative to fixed income offerings, there is a very very substantial advantage associated with long shorts. Thank you. No fair point noted, uh, Harsh, and I think it's slightly for the more evolved, uh, you know, customer. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm conscious of time, so I just have a last couple of questions. And this one is to you, Harsh. Uh, you know, uh, we've been discussing about alpha. We've been discussing about active versus passive. Uh, there's also this debate, uh, you know, in the investor mind about. Um, especially when it comes to PMS about uh, paying a fixed fee or, you know, uh, wanting to have a full performance based fees. And incrementally, we are seeing, you know, a beeline being made towards these uh, full performance based uh, variable uh, strategies, which are pulling in more money. So any thoughts, any quick thoughts on these, you know, as a money manager or as a business manager, what should really one look for? Or it's, it's just par for the course. So there is two. There are two perspectives to it. One is what what investors want and what asset managers want. So clearly, very clearly, a performance fee based structure is most aligned to investors' interests. You know, there will be years when, let's say, your equity markets returns will be twenty percent plus. In those years, investors would have wished that they had opted for fixed fee rather than the performance fee. But those are years are few and far in between. Most managers would prefer a fixed fee structure because. You know, they have fixed expenses. They have to pay their operations team, their fund managers. So there is a whole lot of expenses associated with the business itself. So if everything is related to performance and basically outperformance over benchmark, the visibility on your income stream will be far reduced. So I don't think the asset managers can have only performance oriented uh, fee structure uh, while investors would like that. So going forward, I think the, there will be some, some sort of convergence where you will have a hybrid model uh, where your fixed fee will drop and you will have some sort of performance fee. So the fixed fee will take care of the asset manager's expenses. And if you're outperforming your benchmark, you're doing well, then you get some uh, carry along with it. We are already seeing that uh, having uh, that sort of fee structure coming in PMS in AIF. And very interestingly, Lashmi, uh, there is a, a, a recent uh, discussion happening at SEBI's end where they are mulling, whether yeah. they can introduce this fixed plus performance fee structure in a mutual fund also. Absolutely. So if that happens, I think it will be a big game changer for the industry because if mutual funds do it, then everybody else will have to follow. Absolutely. But, so what would you prefer, Harsh, as an investor? Would you put your money in a fixed fee fund or a variable performance linked? Uh, as an fund? investor, I would put it in uh, completely in performance fee based. Uh, but but as a manufacturer, sure. I'm sure you want more money coming into fixed. So yeah, beauty lies yeah, again but, in value of the yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, Shrikant, I have my last question for you, and uh, and this is a slightly uh, uh, a touchy feely kind of a question. You know, we always know that uh, form is temporary, but class is permanent. Um, unfortunately, when it comes to you know gatekeepers in wealth management outfits, or when it's investors who are uh, uh, you know investing their money through or you know uh, directly into these uh, schemes. Uh, they always expect that form also has to be permanent and class also has to be permanent, which means in, in irrespective of whether the bowler is putting in a googly or whether it is a yorker or it is a full shot, there is an expectation that the batsman or the bats person has to always keep batting for those fours and sixes. So, um, and then the, the tolerance for underperformance, whether it's vis-a-vis -vis the benchmark or whether it's vis-a-vis -vis the peer, uh, is, is not really a very high on tolerance. So how do you really keep yourself afloat to this highly competitive and this, you know, uh, high-end demand, as I would say, high-maintenance demand from the investor uh, fraternity? Thanks, Lakshmi. That's a very, very good question. Probably this is a question that I'll address to both uh, the fund management community and the wealth management community. Uh, I have a suggestion to solve this first. I think all fund managers should be wealth managers for a while and all wealth managers should be fund managers for a while. Uh, the reason I say this is uh, most fund managers probably, you know, in my own career, I met with uh, hundreds of fund managers over the decades. Nobody has asked me what my life is with my client. And I have not asked a fund manager theoretically what his, his life in terms of making decisions around security selection, next location. There is a gap. 
The gap is as follows. Our conversations with clients generally start with absolute return mindsets. Okay, there is a financial plan, there's a nest allocation, there's a discounted of future the savings, there's an expected growth. We try to manage what could be their ideal strategic nest allocation. Then we adopt it to the market conditions based on our reading on market cycles, the interplay between various forces, and then see whether the journey can be smoother. And then we move to product selections. When we come to product selection, there is a stated objective that the fund manager has, which we believe will be suitable in certain phases of the markets and certain phases of the client's life itself and try to match this. The problem comes is that relative, the absolute return conversations move to relative return conversations. A client who said, I want 12% return, initially is happy even if 12 comes in for various reasons he thinks it's a great deal. But the minute markets have given 15 and our fund manager only given 12, he's suddenly disappointed with both. Okay, so, this is uh, the beginning of many, many iterations where the relative return gain moves away from absolute returns to relative reason, uh, returns vis-a-vis -vis the absolute return expectations. Then the expectation is what did the other wealth manager do? What did the other fund managers who are probably are in touch with our ultra China clients do? So this mixes the whole uh, thing in that nobody is uh, able to remember how it all began. This is one. We, another challenge we have is not being able to predict how the fund managers uh, portfolio are likely to do okay in the sense that there is a stated objective of the fund manager he says i will have for example this style this asset location this is my reading of companies this is my preference this is my uh, churn ratios etc i can assure you that uh, in my reading of portfolio disclosures over the decades i could never predict what they said how it actually unfolded and whether it can be a lead indicator of the future performance. So there is a huge dichotomy in stated uh, ways of functioning of a fund manager. And I would believe it is out due to a lot of challenges. One challenge could be that you, you, know, you also have uh, peer pressure to outperform the next fund manager. So sometimes I see fund managers chasing short-term uh, you know, opportunities, resulting into a lot of churn, sometimes deviating from the absolute return mindset that they said they're looking at companies for the long term, but in fact, end up uh, index hugging. So as wealth manager, we are also not able to make sense, you know, how to tell a good fund from a bad fund or a mediocre fund. So what happens at the end of the day is if I have a moving goalpost to observe, which is what the fund manager's life is also in reflection, I'm not able to respond. So more, I am saying uh, uh, as a typical wealth manager, not uh, about uh, Shrikant or Neo, but generally we are disoriented. We end up therefore looking at what is already produced as an outcome with the fond hope that it will continue. Whereas your outperformance has come because the phase in the market has coincided with your selection. So this difficulty can only be resolved when fund managers explain the process of security selection, explain and set the right expectations in which market phases this deliver and which it will not deliver and help the wealth manager also select the proportions in which the fund manager can be uh, whose services can be uh, adopted. If they are not able to pass on that education, the advisor is not also able to pass on that education to clients and by his patients. So in this game, I think everybody have to come together, drop the veil of uh, you know um, all the processes that hide behind the fact sheets and bring closer to stated objective. If that happens, I believe tolerance and all people you know you know in all the segments of the industry will increase, and that will lead to long term ability to hold on to investments. And I believe most customers will end up having right expectations that are easily met. This is my view uh, to solve the problem. No, I think uh, very rightly put. And, uh, you know, uh, to close this conversation, Madan, uh, you know, since, uh, uh, you know, we belong to the same fraternity, we are the long only people uh, uh, who uh, bat for long only uh, long term sustenance of alpha. Uh, the question to you is, uh, what is the verdict? Uh, will long only survive? Uh, A. And would you like to switch, uh, uh, you know, uh, frames with Srikanth and say that, you know, let's do, uh, I'll, I'll do a short term sabbatical, move on to a role and try to understand that and then come back and do more alpha or you say that, nahi ye hamare liye theek hai, and we are more empathetic than ever. Your views, Madan? No, I think, uh, um, see, I keep it very simple and that's how my money is also invested. It's not something... I'm not advising investors something and uh, doing something else for my money. So I keep it very simple and all my money is invested in my own uh, strategies, primarily because 
what I feel is, uh, if I can retire today and just manage my money, and then with a view that I can generate a 14-15% uh, return, uh, I'm next 15 years, I'm talking about an eight times multiplier impact on my money. I can happily retire with a lot of money more than I will require. But in the meantime, there will come an inflation, there will come an interest rate cycle, there will come an election. A uh, lot of noise will be around us. I, I think uh, just for being focused on businesses, good businesses from a long term and staying with the thought process has created a lot of money. Uh, that is the reason why we insist that investors come, stay with us, uh, don't react to short-term market cycles. Uh, then you obviously would end up making those wrong choices and might get it on both the side of the coin. Uh, like what could happen uh, in 22 and 23, if that's what we feel that it's like looking like two sides of the same coin, uh, opposite sides of the same coin. So uh, that, that's the reason why we uh, insist upon it. And uh, um, I think there is no way you will not become richer if you just, even between a Q1 and a Q2 fund manager, if you are anywhere between those fund managers, you will still make a lot of money for you. By shifting from Q1 to Q4, you might end up actually making a lot more mistakes is what I feel. No, no, fair point. And I think, uh, you know, if I were to summarize that, in, I started off with, a, you know, filmy parlance. If I were to end it with a food parlance, uh, long only funds, you know, with alpha generating potential are li actually like the curd rice. Uh, of course, with the curd rice, you require some tadka of maybe, you know, grated carrots and your uh, uh, pomegranates and garnish it with some coriander, etc. Uh, so those are obviously the peripheries that you require in the form of some sectoral funds, some long shot funds and some passive funds. But clearly the verdict uh, is there that uh, India is the land of alpha uh, Alpha dhoondte reh jaoge, thik baat nahi hai. Agar har din dhoondte rohoge, to obviously khojna mushkil hai. So it's important to keep the faith uh, in the asset management industry and uh, probably control your greed and fear. And please understand, believe it in the fact that more than 93% of your returns actually come in from the asset allocation part. And therefore, that is something which you as investors um, along with your advisors, distributors should really focus on. And, you know, to end it on a poetic note, I would say, you know, uh, in, in Shire ki taur pe agar kahu to, ye alpha nahi aasa, bas itna samaj lije, ek risk return uh, ka dariya hai, aur dube to bhi ubar ke aana hai. So keep the faith, that is a long-term India story. And thank you so much for being a lovely and patient audience and a fantastic panel.